Please be seated. When I was a little kid, one of my favorite TV shows was Mr. Dress Up. Even though it ran from 1967 until 1996, very few Americans know about this show. But it was extremely popular in Canada. And apparently in my house in Snohomish got CBC. The entire premise of the show revolves around Mr. Dress Up. He was an older man with, with thick rimmed glasses and he had the help of Casey and Finnegan who were two puppets. He would sing songs. He would draw pictures. He would teach the alphabet and do art projects and teach children how to spell. But my favorite part was his namesake. He had a trunk in his living room filled with costumes. And he would put them on and he would tell stories and encourage kids to use their imaginations. Sometimes he would dress as a big lizard. Other times he put on a jacket with an extra three arms on each side and played the guitar as a spider. I loved it. And it's, it's not that any of his costumes were particularly believable. Compared to what we see on TV and movies now, they were simplistic, they were homemade. He was clearly never becoming a lizard or a spider. And his all too human face was always on display, rarely more than minorly decorated. But what he did was encourage you to use your imagination. He invited you to imagine the possibilities. What would you do if you could put on a lizard suit and pretend, and I mean really pretend, so, that so you even may start to believe that you are a lizard? What would you do as a king with a cape and a crown? Or as a monkey with a fuzzy suit and big ears that stick out to the side? Today we're celebrating the feast of Saint Nicholas of Myra. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this man who evolved into Santa Claus in this country. It's hard to turn around this time of year without seeing at least a few Santa decorations. But this jolly man in red was actually a real person. Nicholas was born in the year 270 of Common Era in a city in modern day Turkey called Myra. Growing up, his uncle was the bishop and maybe Nicholas saw him and thought he was doing good work, so he decided to enter the clergy as well. He became a priest. And later, after his uncle died, he inherited this, this see of Myra and he became a bishop. And then he later died himself on December 6th in the year 343 of the Common Era. And that's when we celebrate him, December 6th. That's also pretty much all we know for sure about his entire life. But there are legends, and oh, oh how there are legends. He saves some children who have been butchered and placed in brine to cure so that the butcher can then serve them to the poor village as pork. He rescues ships that have been tossed at sea. He calms the waves. And he saves his town from starvation by multiplying wheat. But the most popular story about St. Nicholas, the one that most people know more than any of the others, actually has no supernatural events in it. And it doesn't require a lot of imagination to believe that it could actually happen. Any one of us could actually do it. The story goes that there were three girls who lived with their poor father. He was unable to pay their dowries so that they could get married. The result of that at the time was that they had no opportunities for work 
And without getting married, they would be forced into prostitution. Nicholas saw this family, though, and he only wanted good things for them. So one night, he snuck up on their house and he dropped a bag of gold in their window. The family woke up the next morning and they were excited and a little confused because they'd found this gold just sitting in their house, but they didn't really question it. This was, this was a present. And then the next night, St. Nicholas came again, and again he dropped a bag of money into their window. Now at this point, the girl's father was getting a little bit curious about who kept dropping this money into their house. And he hoped, actually, that this, this money-giving person would come back again. So he waited up all night, hoping that St. Nicholas would return. And Nicholas came again with a third bag of money. And he came up to the house and he dropped it in the window, at which point the father ran outside and thanked Nicholas for his tremendous gift. Each bag that Nicholas dropped into that house was enough for a dowry for each of the girls so that they could be married. But there was a caveat. Before Nicholas went on his way, he asked the man to keep his identity and his deeds a secret. It's from this story and from some other places that people began giving gifts to each other this time of year. Traditionally, children leave out their shoes on December 5th, St. Nicholas Eve, and the next morning they wake up to find gifts in them. The Feast of St. Nicholas has also led to another tradition. Now this tradition reached its heights during the Middle Ages. There was a tradition in parishes of selecting what was called a Nicholas Bishop, or a child bishop. This person was a child from the parish, often a cathedral, who would serve as the bishop from the Feast of St. Nicholas on December 6th until the Feast of the Holy Innocents on December 28th. The child would dress in a bishop's outfit and serve in services, join processions, and generally just kind of go about learning more about the church. So in the spirit of St. Nicholas and Mr. Dress Up, I want to do something a little bit different. Can I have three volunteers? <laughs> Don't everyone all come up at once. <laughs> so, shortly before the next service, I'm going to be putting on all of this religious finery um, to be St. Nicholas for just a short time, and I hope that the congregation will pretend along with me. But for right now, I want to make you each St. Nicholas's. <laughs> so the first thing that St. Nicholas gets is a stole, because he is a priest. And this is the stole that we will use. And the other thing is this pointy bishop's hat, also called a miter. We'll see if your head might be better. <laughs> right, small. Perfect. <laughs> and then the last piece is, is a coat. And this is just another fancy church word for a cape that a bishop is wearing. Let's get you all fascinated. For now, these are your St. Nicholas's. Let's give them a round of applause. And so you can go back to your seats right now. Please keep your articles on, and I'll draw on you later in the service.
Thank you. <laughs> and now I hope you are beginning to realize that this feast day is not just for children, but also children at heart. Jesus wants us to be more like children. We hear it in today's gospel. After the disciples try to keep children away, Jesus gets indignant or angry in the Greek at the behavior of his disciples. It is one of the few places where Jesus gets actually angry. He tells his disciples, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Theologian Arthur Murphy doesn't think that this translation is full, is robust enough. And so he fleshes out the term little child for us. He insists that this term carries with it a concept of merriment, of jesting, even dancing, but most importantly, of play. We are to receive the kingdom of God then, the reign of God, as a playful one. Let the playful ones come to me. When was the last time you played? When was the last time you did something purposeless, fun, pleasurable? Playing dress up as saints who threw money in open windows is a little bit silly, but does that make it any less important? Unlike children, as adults, we don't often allow ourselves to play. Now, we allow play if it comes in some kind of competitive sport form, but rarely anything else. Dr. Scott Eberly, who is the editor, and I kid you not, of the American Journal of Play, as well as a researcher in play studies, sees a problem with this kind of mindset. He says that we don't lose the need for the novelty and the pleasure of play as we grow up. And just in case you might be inclined to disagree with me that writing off play maybe is a waste of time, let me tell you this. Play has been found to be as important a factor as any other in predicting criminal behavior among murderers in Texas. It helps couples rekindle their relationships it enhances emotional intimacy. It creates deep, deep connection between strangers. And it aids in physical healing. Jesus doesn't let us off the hook. Jesus doesn't say, let those who are playful as children and then serious as adults come to me. No. Let the playful ones come to me. Our God seeks a playful relationship with us. Our God is something altogether new and amazing. Within God, there's unabashed joy and pleasure, deep reciprocal relationships, and profound closeness. Jesus longs for us to see this truth. Can I get my volunteers back? <laughs> You can stand right in the center. Thank you. Even if the people we see dressed here as Saint Nicholas are not the saint himself who died in 343, doesn't it make you think about him nonetheless? We can't see or touch or hear Saint Nicholas, but we can engage with these proxies dressed in bishop's regalia. 
We can play and pretend and imagine what it would be like to meet him face to face. We can take inspiration from his actions to care for the poor. We can even be like Mr. Dress Up, and I would encourage it, and put on clothes like St. Nicholas and even try to get into his mindset. But above all, we can be like the little children who trust that the world is full of wonder and that God always wants to play with us. Do we dare to accept that? Our place in the kingdom of God may depend on it. Thank you, St. Nicholas's. <laughs>